Hey, it's Chris Plus Plus. This is a film inspired by Adam Trianfo and the computer-related videos for his great channel, Bally Alley, a supplement of an incredible website that he created over 20 years ago and continues to maintain and into which he still uploads material. Bally Alley, period, com. And one of the several million reasons he's my closest friend is that he puts up with quirks of mine such as saying period instead of dot because for some reason dot bugs me in that context. However, for the purposes of modern convention, and so you'll more readily visit his website, it's ballyalley.com. You'll find everything you ever wanted to know about the Bally Professional Arcade slash Astrocade there, as well as a lot you never realized you wanted to know, and an immense amount of archived material that can be found nowhere else. I'm going to talk about the day I received my first 8-bit computer, the mighty Commodore 64. I'm not speaking live, as it were, as I'm flipping through the images on the screen. Rather, this is a pre-recorded voiceover, which is probably already apparent, and if it's not, it certainly will be very soon. What you'll see being typed in are the same programs I entered when the computer was new to me. The demonstrations found in the C64 user's guide which I read cover to cover very early on and continue to refer to now in uh, 2021, even though I haven't written a program yet this year, it's only January. Whenever I write programs that rely on knowing memory locations, pinpointing screen coordinates and reminding myself of related stuff. I'd like to thank Adam for giving me the user's guide. I don't know what happened to my original copy. I see from the receipt taped to the inner front cover that whoever bought the computer with which this book came paid $219 for it on November 3rd, 1983. Not a bad price at the time. At a store called Zaire, Z-A-Y-R-E. I think that was a department store. There's another receipt from four days later with ink that has survived much better because the paper was tucked behind the original taped on receipt, library card style. It appears that some software purchases were made, uh, perhaps with one seventy-dollar peripheral. I can't tell what I have, any of them were because only their product codes appear on the receipt, apart from the computer on, on the other one, and apart from the possible peripheral, which was a Commodore VT. I can't figure out what that stands for. Does anyone have any idea? As a brief exposition, around toddlerhood and slightly afterward on weekends when my father asked want to play hockey and hooked up our dedicated pong console the magnavox odyssey 300 i was captivated by the fact that you could move something around that was on tv it was an event whenever we played it and a magical novelty of sorts and caused me to have thoughts that i didn't know how to articulate yet but which hinged upon the fact that the merely passive had somehow impossibly become interactive. The television wasn't just for staring at and listening to after all. I could control it. I had also been entranced by the only two coin-operated arcade games I had ever seen or played around the age of nine, Asteroids Deluxe and Pac-Man. You could now fire at and blow up spaceships, zap alien life forms, and eat infinite dots and fruit without getting any bigger. The element that truly makes the game of Pac-Man work, so to speak, the turn the tables element, obviously initiated via consumption of the energizers, was the carrot that really pulled me in. I know that's a vegetable and not a fruit, but never mind. If only I could somehow get sufficient quarters from Dad to learn how to play well enough to make it to one of those large flashing circles, I could eat the monsters instead of running, well, jawing away from them. The fact that each of the enemies took its own route and behaved a bit differently from the others was also an element that wasn't taken for granted yet. And then, of course, there were the vivid colors. As beautiful as the vector graphics were in Asteroids Deluxe, I didn't know they were called vector graphics, of course, and that the others were called raster. My brain was just coping with what I was seeing. These enticingly abstract cartoons and the fact that I got to take part in the on-screen story told by the action itself. I didn't even know these things were called video games yet. In my head, there were pinball tables and now Asteroids Deluxe machines and Pac-Man machines. Our family got an Atari VCS before I even knew what it was. From that point on, uh, talk about obsession, uh, but I'll, I'll get into that. 
Within a few months, I had read probably an electronic games magazine. The video games were actually computer programs, and that while many of the faster ones were written in a computer language called assembly, it was much more difficult than the common first language learned by programmers, BASIC. I was determined to learn BASIC and somehow get hold of a computer so I could make my own video games. And it will now be best and prevent rewriting the wheel, so to speak, if I read a few brief excerpts from a book I completed in 2015, the classic gaming bookcast. If you'd like to read the whole thing, it's available for free, uh, along with several articles, which are also about old video games, on the website that Adam founded and that he and I write for, orphanedgames.com. My temporarily video game curious father brought home an Atari video computer system in February of 1982 when I was 10. Now for the most part this sort of thing only happened when it was birthday or Christmas time, which it currently wasn't. He had also bought Space Invaders, so he must have been playing the coin op somewhere. Looking back, I feel lucky that he's always been curious about new technology. In fact, his interest has surpassed mine since then, at least in terms of modernity. He doesn't play video games anymore, but he's confounded by my unwillingness to get a cellular phone. The minor role reversal is comical. For some reason, I had hardly been aware of the VCS, later renamed the 2600, of course, based on its model number. I seldom watched television even back then, and uh, in any case, didn't stick around for the commercials or muted them. So I must have figured this enigmatic Atari thing I'd heard about at school for yet another Pong clone. The occasional classmate would announce, we got an Atari, in a tone of voice suggesting that his parents had decided to trade the family car for an airplane. We didn't have the Sears version. It was an early Atari 4 switcher with combat packed in. I inspected the console box after Dad removed its contents, and it began to dawn on me. Those extraordinary games for which I never had sufficient quarters could somehow be played on the television. As trite as it sounds, this was utterly too good to be true. And VCS games turned out to be much more intriguing indeed than so-called hockey, of course. They were too good. I couldn't, quote, play Atari enough. That was all I did when allowed. I also coveted games that I hadn't played yet. I didn't care which ones they were. I just wanted to see what they were like. They all looked exciting. I didn't stop running around outdoors, riding my bike, trying to improve on the piano and guitar, but otherwise I invariably pretended that I was inside some kind of video game setting, even when I wasn't playing. I obsessed over the screenshots in the green-covered Atari catalog and Tom Hirschfeld's How to Master the Video Games. I had ordered it from Weekly Reader, or the Scholastic Book Order Forum, maybe. And if memory serves, it had taken precisely 60 years to arrive. I've always gotten a kick out of the title, How to Master the Video Games. One set of games had been made, and that was going to be it. There you go, kid. Now get lost. I invented new games that I fantasized about programming someday, in notebooks and drawing tablets, and on my trapper keeper, and the wooden slats supporting the upper bunk, I drew the graphics of games that I could, quote, play by moving the tip of my finger around. During our summertime 82 visit to Buffalo, I learned how to program in BASIC, the era's common entry-level computer language, by reading a book that I'd borrowed from the library near my grandmother's house. I can't remember the name, but I'd recognize the cover if I saw it. I've actually looked for the damn thing online. I can only recollect the title's science fiction-y typeface on the cover, and it was hardback. I started writing out my own basic programs almost immediately. Most of them were choose-your-own-adventure type games. The instructional book wasn't computer-specific, so it didn't extend to graphics. All that I knew how to work with at the moment was text. After returning to Albuquerque, I continued to fill college-ruled pages with code, but I wouldn't be able to try out any of my ideas until January of 84, when Dependable Dad bought me a Commodore 64 for my 12th birthday. I've been playing the old games ever since. In the mid-90s, I began to notice unfamiliar adjectives when applied to games, such as classic and retro. I thought, oh, they're classic now, are they? Well, <laughs> if you say so. They don't feel aged to me, as I associate them with recent playing, having never really stopped. I've only added. New old favorites, so to speak, are discovered all the time. So nostalgia plays a very, very small part for me. A brief interjection before I'm done reading. I'm telling these 
pre-C64 stories as an introduction, as it's difficult to really put into words how fascinated with and obsessed by my new Commodore computer I was. And uh, to be honest, I remain. Even the initial sensations didn't begin to wear off for at least four years. And here's part of my obsession. This part of the book is about the VCS game Adventure by Atari. I won't read all of it, only the bits that I think are relevant to this uh, admittedly verbose introduction. During an extended family visit to Buffalo in 1982, I was shown, and thankfully permitted to play, Adventure by an older kid named Robert, whose mother remains one of my aunt's best friends. I chose the cartridge from the stack in his family's den, always anxious to try out an unfamiliar game. He switched it on and pushed Game Reset, and I've never recovered. The game blew my brains out through my hair. You could move off the whole television. It took me a few seconds, but I caught on. The screen now showed a different room. It all struck me as an uncommonly large, no, gigantic area to move around in with none of the customary constraints. I was later shown Demon Attack and Laser Blast, but I wasn't as interested in those, flashy as they were. After demonstrating adventure for a couple of minutes, Robert handed me the joystick and guided me through game one. When I beat it, he explained that I would ultimately want to play game three if I wound up getting the cartridge, as the kingdom was much larger and the objects and characters were in different places each time. Regrettably, I haven't been in touch with Robert since that visit, uh, when he also revealed unto me the incredible wizard on his Bally Professional Arcade before I ever saw the arcade original Wizard of War, and audio cassettes that magnetically stored Atari 400-800 programs, which he had typed in from books and magazines. The very idea enthralled me. Computer games hidden on innocent-looking music tapes. Imagine that. It was also during that summer vacation when I borrowed the aforementioned basic book from the library and bought my first copy of Electronic Games, the earliest magazine to be dedicated to video games, at a Wilson Farms convenience store in Tonawanda, the suburb where my aunt lived. It was the July 1982 issue. Her daughters, my cousins Denise and Mary, had Circus Atari and the fascinating Superman. It was all nearly overwhelming for a relatively new game fanatic. Back in Albuquerque, I reread that issue of E.G. so often that I incidentally memorized it. Part of the reason was that Bill Game Doctor Kunkel had written an enticing adventure synopsis under a pseudonym. Looking back, one of the likable things about his early 80s articles is that he didn't really write reviews. Tastes are, well, obviously subjective and impervious to criticism. So he didn't bother with ratings, grades, or anything so futile. What he wrote were overviews, really, and he often included strategies. Readers were thus informed of what they could expect from each game before deciding how to spend their cash. Thanks to the adventure article and a dictionary, I learned the definitions of carcass, catacomb, um, chalice, cursor, labyrinth, origin, quest, random, reincarnate, and toggle, having been confused by the phrase reset toggle. I'd certainly never acquired so much vocabulary at once from a school textbook. It's all about where one's enthusiasms lie. Whenever I happen upon one of the words, its very shape reminds me of those two magazine pages. Now kindly allow me a few additional words about Bill Kunkel, who granted me an interview for Orphan Computers and Game Systems about, well, what is it now, 16 years ago. <laughs> I have 10 years ago written in the book. Ed Averett's Odyssey 2 game KC Munchkin was released by North American Phillips slash Magnavox in November of 1981. It was unreleased by Atari in March of 1982. The latter company had claimed in court that the game was unacceptably familiar to Pac-Man, whose home versions it held the rights to. Whereas North American Phillips had initially prevailed, Atari won the case on appeal. This was in the midst of its tenacious protection of the Pac-Man license from infringement by publishers whose gobble games were superior to its own uh, 2600 conversion of the real thing. Kunkel risked the perks of his career as a game journalist by testifying against Atari. He rightly felt that Casey Munchkin contained enough differences to be considered a unique game. This display of integrity was, and obviously remains, uncharacteristic of most people in his general profession. 
He held neither livelihood nor corporate favoritism above principle. We could use a few more like him. He's missed. Finally, this especially brief part of the book is about the Bally Midway arcade game Tron. In late 82 or early 83, we rented the movie Tron for our Betamax VCR. Preposterously, I hadn't gotten around to seeing it on the big screen. I figured out how to copy the movie using a borrowed second machine and watched it over and over again. I bought the VHS tape five or six years later and the double DVD on the film's 20th anniversary in 2002. Some of the dialogue might have been hokey, even when the movie was new, but I was mesmerized by the visualizations and plot details. I tended to live in my own world half the time anyway. Upon seeing Tron, I transformed the real one from inside my head. I didn't quite mean to. It just made the repetitious things in a kid's life cooler. I left solid walls of light along the sidewalk, and the glinting tiles and painted over bricks of my elementary school became circuited tunnels through which I ominously soared. I wasn't noticeably physical about any of this. I didn't have to be. I had already filled my skull with video game images over the prior year. Now the three-dimensional ramifications of living in that universe were absorbed into my mental metabolism. The screens that connected the everyday world to these new ones weren't monitors or television tubes, but windows, as far as I was concerned, or at least as far as a large part of my imagination was concerned. Locations from various games flew enticingly past me as I walked by things as formerly ordinary as jungle gyms and chain-link fences. It's not that I didn't enjoy being a kid. There were simply aspects that I found objectionable. Being expected to attend school every day felt like a prison sentence, and I know I wasn't alone with that feeling, and I reviled not having the adult abilities to do stuff. This didn't concern unrestricted toy shopping. <laughs> theme park trips or other external extravagances. I wanted to play real musical instruments and write real books. I could save out job money toward the former and practice the latter on my mom's typewriter, but I wasn't skilled yet and I was impatient to truly get started. Something that was possible, however, was to competently explore that limitless other place, finding and doing things previously consigned to my imagination. Tron alluringly blurred the line. I could even learn to create my own parts of that other place, if only I could get my hands on a computer. As I was already acclimating myself to a coexistence with other humans by adopting the crucial society of stupidly funny mindset, I didn't know how to apply words like absurdly amusing, it was impactful to see just how easily alternate life could be created. My widening eyes watched Flynn and Allen actually communicating with the humanoid programs they had, quote, written using secret messages such as request access to clue program, code 6, password to memory, 0222. Outside the VCR, every spinning thing that I saw reminded me of the master control program, and anything laid out in a grid fashion was an electronic, beautifully unambiguous expanse. When Flynn was sucked into the collective digital world and was able to interact with the walking, talking realizations of his own keyboard work, I was sucked in myself. The main function of teachers seemed to be to detract my attention from the things with which I really love to fill my brain. Their inapplicable blather might have prepared me to be a good drone, so it's fortunate that affordable home video games came along when they did. I believe that I initially played the Tron coin-op in the small game room at Uncle Cliff's, an Albuquerque amusement park. The name has since been changed to Cliff's, but he's not fooling anyone. He's still my uncle. When I play it now, it strikes me as a continually repeated quartet of largely derivative sub-games that rapidly rise in difficulty. It's blatantly designed to scarf up as much money as possible. In this sense, I suppose, it was technologically prophetic. My associations with the game are so positive that I occasionally play it anyway. I have a great time, notwithstanding any opinions I've formed since the 80s. This is perhaps the only arcade game from which I cannot objectively detach my early affection. For the kid, Chris was captivated. It was as close as I could get to literally playing a part of the movie, and I watched older players until I memorized their tactics and patterns. I became quite good myself and still remember most of the maneuvers. 
In fact, if I'm out on one of my treasured nighttime walks and I get hit by a falling piano or something, I'll be in trouble when I try to recall my blood type. The poor paramedic will hear little more than high speed, forward, right, left, left, left. He'll be all set if he ever gives up his work to drive a light cycle, though. I should know. That's where I'll end the excerpts from the Classic Gaming Bookcast. In late January of 1984, as stated, almost exactly two years to the month after we got our Atari VCS, I came home from school and was asked by my folks to walk into the spare room, which was next to the bedroom shared between me and my younger brother Mike. My dad's old roll-top desk had been in the spare room for a couple of years and not used for much. Curious, it's in my mom and stepfather's house now. Hmm. Anyway, at the time, the desk had most recently exhibited a Zenith computer terminal. It was supposed to communicate with the Zenith computer itself, which my dad had at his podiatry practice. But I don't think it ever worked properly, as it wasn't around long. The terminal couldn't do anything by itself. It had no built-in language, or even a CPM-type prompt, I think. But I was so captivated by computers in general, and the idea of programming them that I made designs on the screen by moving the cursor around and repeatedly typing a character the Zenith had that looked nearly like a reversed space, but which was actually an, a number sign with more lines added, like a tiny checkerboard or something, and I'd pretend they were game screens. I had briefly messed with Logo on one of the computers in the lab at John Adams Middle School. It was a room I um, only visited once for some reason. I think it was something like a field trip without leaving the school, if you will, that one of my actual classes took. And why computer science was never offered as an elective, at least in eighth grade, is beyond me. It was probably an Apple II running logo, but I guess it could have been an Atari 400 or 800. I tried to recreate one of the screens in Adventure during the few minutes I was left happily alone at the keyboard. I had also seen my friends Scott and Jeremy's Vic-20, and that alone flared up my imagination to the point of daydreaming about having my own computer. They loaded up Oregon Trail from a cassette, and just those magical messages, searching for game, as if the computer was on some quest to find something for us to play, and loading, and of course the endlessly beckoning ready just entranced the hell out of me. Even the fact that the program lines, when Scott listed Oregon Trail, and even some of the narrative lines within the game, wrapped back to the left side of the screen without bothering to keep the word complete when it was too long to fit. Even that was highly intriguing to me for some reason. This was no mere typewriter. As long as the computer got or, or communicated the information, it was valid. We also played the cartridge-based game Jupiter Lander, the Commodore version of Atari's Lunar Lander coin-op, as I found out a few years later. Until my birthday in 84, which mercifully fell on a Friday, those were the only fleeting and almost cruelly teasing experiences with computers, as opposed to consoles, that I'd ever had. Apart from a few minutes in a local computer store whose name is lost in my brain, my dad's curiosity had led us to stop there one day in 82, there was an Apple clone there called the Ace 1000. Memory tells me that there was a less souped up version of the computer on a nearby table. Maybe that was called the Ace 500. Anyway, the Ace was running Choplifter. I watched, mesmerized, as the stick men on the ground behaved as if they were really alive, running toward buildings for shelter, waving thankful goodbyes after the adult who was playing the game set them onto safe ground and flew his chopper away and doing other uncommonly animate things. I think there was also an Atari 8-bit running in the demo section of that computer store. As the stars moving in 3D fashion toward the windshield view of Star Raiders also sucked me in. I don't think that game was ever available on an Apple. Now my dad knew that I was interested in programming and that I badly wanted a computer. I had been excited for a few months because I knew he knew and I'd been slightly disappointed when there wasn't a computer under the tree in December. He talked about it sometimes, though, and gave me this strong impression that he was waiting to figure out which one would be the best investment. I even recall a time in late 83, or very early 84, when he said that he was, in his words, looking at the Commodore 64. I didn't know what that was, or realized the Commodore also made the VIC-20 I had spent about an hour with, mostly watching my friends type. As I walked into the spare room after school, 
I saw my father's extremely generous birthday presents, a beautiful computer with a rainbow logo on it, helping to explain that this was, in fact, the Commodore 64, a new, smallish colored TV to which it was connected, a 1541 floppy disk drive, about which I barely knew compared with the more familiar tape recorders, a 1526 dot matrix printer, and a VIC modem, probably named thus because it also worked in the VIC-20. It could handle a blinding 120 baud. No K's there, kids. You dialed a phone number to another computer, and once you were hearing the garbled frequencies, later familiar to fax machine users, you unplugged the wall cord from the phone and plugged it into the side of the modem, which incidentally came with a free certain amount of time on CompuServe, a national BBS-type subscription service that provided a local number for users in pretty much every major city. I remember that as I sat down at the desk and stared at the computer, which he had switched on before I'd gotten home, and that beautiful blue screen with a ready prompt and enticing flashing cursor, he said something into my incessant thank yous and wider than possible eyes like, here you go, happy birthday, now learn how to use that thing, trust me. Talk about being pre scient there was also an intriguing selection of software. Any software would have been fascinating to me, but this was a varied collection that expressed to me, loud and clear, my dad's apparent thought that I already had enough games, as the Atari console was still up and running, and that this should represent a different approach on my part. It was a computer, damn it, and shouldn't merely be used as another game machine. There were Touch Typing Tutor by TaylorMade software, spelled T-A-Y-L-O-R, FaceMaker and KinderComp by Spinnaker. The latter was probably for my seven-year-old brother, as Dad evidently expected me to let him have the occasional try at computing. IFR, a nearly graphics-free flight simulator that had probably been purchased with the plan that my dad himself would occasionally monkey around with a Commodore as he was taking flying lessons. And the closest thing to a game that he had bought, the text adventure Zork 2, The Wizard of Frobaz by Infocom. There was another program in an identical, thin, blue and white, full-page sized cardboard folio, one of the public domain releases the Commodore packaged up and charged cut rates for. It might have been Math 3 or something. He had also bought a terminal software package so I could use the modem. These were all on disk. There was also one cartridge, a word processor, and alleged hub for upcoming office-type software called Magic Desk. I would actually go on to use Magic Desk quite a bit. The fact that it was on cartridge meant that I could save documents onto a disk. He had bought a pack of 10 or 20 blank elephant floppies along with everything else. I'm not sure if he chose this software himself or if some or all of it had been recommended by a salesman at whichever store he had settled on for the purchase. Suffice it to say that I was incredibly grateful. I hadn't expected all of this. I had assumed that the 64 was just one of the options being considered by Dad, and that I still might receive an Ace 1000 or perhaps even a VIC-20. I guess that was because they were among the computers that had most drawn me in, being the majority of those I had even seen in real life until then. I didn't know for a fact, but easily assumed, and certainly discovered not long thereafter, that the 64 was the more powerful computer, the one released by Commodore after the VIC-20. Figuring that I wouldn't be in the mood to leave the spare room to sit and eat dinner, Dad had gotten me a kid-sized burger from McDonald's. I only liked them plain, as I could seldom stomach ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, and, and such at the time, and actually don't like them now. I like to taste the meat itself, you know? Well, when it's actually meat. But anyway, I ate it while looking through all the software, taking bites whenever one of my parents would walk by the room and say, you gotta remember to eat now. I was too entranced to even taste the sauces I didn't like, too fascinated to even care what I was eating, too occupied with getting my head around the fact that I had a computer, to wonder why Dad hadn't remembered that I always ordered plain burgers and sandwiches. It's funny the things you remember, you know? I'm not sure when I was made to go to bed on that Friday night, late I would hope, but I sat there for hours. The first thing I did once my burger was gone was to carefully and almost ceremoniously start typing in order to see if my basic self-tutelage could be applied to the Commodore 64. 
I didn't know about the Hello World convention at the time. I entered 10 print, double quotes, Chris, end quotes, and excitingly got no error. I followed it with 20 go to 10 and then cast the ultimate spell, the final command that represents the programmer's true moment of reckoning, run. It worked. There I saw the short version of my name over and over telling me it was actually possible to make this computer do something with simple instructions. Reading in mental actuality, Chris is now officially a programmer. I went through the user's guide, reading some parts and skimming others, and if I remember correctly, I typed in all of the examples, most of them quite brief programs that appear in those shiny beckoning pages. What I definitely recall is typing in the bouncing ball routines, the hot air balloon sprite demonstrations, and the much longer program that provides a simple piano keyboard meant to illustrate how sounds work on the machine, of course. Poke was a command that I obviously hadn't encountered in the book about BASIC, that book with which I had been obsessed a couple of summers before, that I returned to the Buffalo Library only with great regret, and which was meant to be universal and simply teach the fundamentals. But I know I had seen Poke somewhere. It still existed in my head as an arcane, mysterious instruction, and I was thrilled to be actually typing in programs that included Poke in them. This was some serious programming, I figured. I still typed very slowly and only realized what all the weird symbols on the keyboard were for when I reached the relevant sections in the user's guide. But fast typing would gradually occur, as it did for pretty much everyone, either sooner or later. And in fact, I have my own style. I never properly learned how to touch type, in spite of, you know, eventually owning a program that was supposed to teach me how. Anyway, my slow typing meant that my user's guide exploration may well have continued into the following morning. I'm not saying I stayed up all night. I mean, when I jumped out of bed and ran back into the spare room, forgetting that I was hungry for cereal and toast, I'm sure, before Mom reminded me that I probably was. I watched every demo that I had entered for a few minutes before either turning off the computer and then switching it back on, or figuring out how to stop the program and then typing new and moving on to the next part of the user's guide. I wanted to take in what I had entered because of that somewhat regretful feeling of forever turning the lights out on all the typing work I had just done. I can't remember if I got through all the programs I wanted to enter before summoning the nerve to finally try using the disk drive, or if I decided to do so at some point amid typing them in. It would obviously be a good thing if I could save them. Besides, I wanted to see if that magical searching word appeared on the screen with disks, as it did with tapes on the VIC-20. I can't remember which program I loaded up first. Knowing me, it was Zork 2, as I thought it was an actual video game, the only one I currently had for the 64. But I remember being delighted to see that the computer was indeed searching for the file. In any case, at some point, I tried to figure out how to save a typed-in program onto a blank disk, and I ran into a problem right away. Simply replacing the word load with save got me the flashing red light on the front of the disk drive that told me there was an error. I even called my dad into the room, thinking for some reason that he knew something about working this awesome machine he had bought me. We followed the instructions in the user's guide about how to save a program, and they said to do what I had already done. Save, double quotes, etc. He wound up saying, I don't know, if you can't get it to work, I'll bring it back to the store, see if there's something wrong with it. Desperate not to get my new computer taken away, even for a day, I resorted to reading the manual that had come with the disk drive. I found a section about formatting and the explanation that this had to be done to a new blank disk before programs could be saved on it. So I was hopeful, and I typed in the provided formatting command, and then, after what seemed like a really long wait, tried to save whatever program was in memory, and it worked. Just to be sure, I turned the computer off and then back on and tried to load what I had just saved. When the word ready appeared once again, I either entered run or list. A few seconds later, I was able to run into the living room and tell my dad, I got it to work. You have to format the disk before you can save to it. He clearly had no clue what that meant, but he said something like, good, I'm glad you got it to work. I may have been gently chastised for not reading all the instructions before trying to mess with the disk drive. No biggie. I was happy again after that 15 or 20 minutes of disappointed panic. 
Here's something funny. When I first played Zork 2, which was probably on that Saturday or Sunday, I thought that all of the text descriptions of caverns and streams were parts of a far too detailed introduction before the actual game began. Judging from the ancient looking bricks and wooden door opening into darkness in the Zork logo that peeked out through the blue and white Commodore folio packaging from the large insert within, it was surely a game about dungeons and castles and treasure hunts and those sorts of obviously awesome things. The instructions weren't very helpful. They gave examples of some words and even sentences that could be entered in uh, so you could progress through this uncommonly long intro. And while that was pretty impressive, after typing in directional commands and moving through a few locations, I wanted to get to the damn game already. I reached a location called the Riddle Room. The screen asked, what's as tall as a house, round as a cup, and all the king's horses can't draw it up. Why I couldn't figure out that it was a well is anyone's guess. I wasn't the brightest kid in the world. But it's even more surprising to recall that when I asked for my mom's help, she couldn't figure it out either. I even remember her whispering the words to herself in confusion. Can't draw it up. I don't know. No idea, honey. I can't remember how I arrived at the correct answer, i.e. if it finally dawned on me or if I was just trying anything that came into my head in desperation as I figured that maybe if I got through that door in the riddle room, the game would start. But when I entered the correct punchline and the door swung open with a deafening clap of thunder, I was elated. I typed my character through the door and saw that the words just kept coming. When the hell was I going to be able to play the game? Wait a minute. I looked at the instructions again. It wasn't really a manual. I think it was just a folded piece of glossy black and white paper. That really was all that appeared on it, besides loading instructions and whatnot. A list of general commands and some suggestions about what others you might try, inviting the player to experiment and use his imagination. If there were a game with graphics, beyond all the text I'd been reading, the instructions would at least mention it, surely, right? There was no section about what kind of controller to use, or anything else that might be involved in a video game. What at first was disappointment, upon my realizing that I already had been playing Zork 2 itself, turned into interest, and then, go figure, fun, as I engaged the game as it was, and tried to do well in spite of its lack of joystick needs. At some point over the following week, I even started drawing a map. It took at least a month, but I finally got through all of Zork 2, The Wizard of Frobaz, solved all the puzzles and reached the end, that is, and by that point I was absolutely hooked on what I would later learn was called interactive fiction. I would even wind up writing my own amateurishly programmed text adventure a bit later in 84, calling it Castle of Dread in fine 12-year-old fashion. As you can imagine, I wrote a lot of basic programs in 1984 and 85, and in fact through 2016, when I wrote a classic video game trivia program at Christmas time for Adam, and it won't be the last basic program I write, I still greatly enjoy it. Programming is a game in itself, a kind of complicated crossword puzzle. I never did summon the patience to thoroughly learn assembly, but with the Blitz compiler that speeds up BASIC a lot, I can start writing games that don't involve only or mostly text. I may actually get to that soon. I'm pretty damn good by now at making the Commodore version of Microsoft BASIC do anything I want, as you can imagine, 37 years later. A couple more funny stories. One of the first programs I wrote, if not the very first, was called Spelling Bee. I knew from what I had read in the user's guide and the paperback I had gotten one of my folks to buy me at the grocery store or something that further explained BASIC and which was called Basic Fun, Computer Games, Puzzles and Problems Children Can Write. Although why any kid would want to write a problem is beyond me that I would be using data statements to store all the possible words from which the program would randomly choose to challenge the player. It wasn't until I got to the point in the program at which I had to figure out how to let the player know which word to try spelling correctly that it occurred to me that it was impossible <laughs> to write a spelling bee game without showing the player the word he was supposed to spell, thereby showing him the correct spelling right there on the screen. I felt pretty dumb. 
I didn't know anything about voice synthesis. In any way, I didn't have any such capability at hand. Well, at least the B on the title screen looked kind of cool, if more square-shaped than Bs usually tend to be. I had fashioned it out of reversed black and white spaces and a few keyboard symbols, such as the hollow perfect circle for each of the eyes, and I think a normal slash for the tail. Do bees even have tails? I wound up making it a sort of thesaurus bee. I didn't change the title, but you had to type in a synonym for whichever word you were shown. Part of the challenge was in guessing which synonym I had chosen to pair with each word, as I don't believe it occurred to me to include multiple possible answers for each one. At another time, after I really figured out how to get the 64 to make sounds, I wrote a War Games inspired program simulating breaking into a computer at the US Pentagon or NORAD or something. I put everything in it, frequently changing background and border colors, siren sounds to accompany messages that I had breached security and would get into legal trouble, flashing screens and even fake modem noises so I could pretend that I had actually connected with the computer. When my friend Brett came over to my house one afternoon, I dialed some BS number on the phone and went through the motions of plugging it into the Vic modem. I surreptitiously started the program, which I had already loaded, by changing the character color to the background color so my run would be invisible. He was getting more and more nervous as I contrived codes to enter, pretending to be making good guesses, but knowing that whatever I typed in would advance me to the next part of the program in each case. And he was saying things like, I think you'd better hang up, and maybe you'd better stop. When we got to the point at which the screen displayed a countdown before missiles would supposedly be launched at Russia, he was saying, Chris, I'm gonna go home. You should stop this. But he couldn't take his eyes off the screen, and when the background and border both turned red, and the message appeared that I had launched missiles, complete with siren noises, he went home. My mother got a call from his about half an hour later, after he had walked home. He had tried to keep it a secret, but he was so worried that I had caused serious trouble, and that we might be in trouble ourselves, that he just couldn't help but to tell his mom what he had seen. And my mom said something like, You've got him really worried. What did you do? I laughed and said it had been a practical joke. Well, you'd better tell him that. He's really scared. I got on the phone and told him it was a program I had written to fool him. He wasn't happy with me. But you know, kids, he got over it pretty quickly. Within a few months, I was able to see the incredible graphical power of the C64. The children of my dad's second partner had Zaxxon on disc, the conversion by Synapse and that's the good version of the game for the 64. As opposed to Sega's own adaptation, curiously, Synapses looks like a detailed, almost photorealistic cartoon, at least when compared with the likes of Touch Typing Tutor, and plays very smoothly, especially with Atari's CX40 joystick, whose compatibility with the 64 I must have figured out at some point. Anyway, I got relatively good at Zaxxon by being a bad guest i.e. sitting at the computer desk in the playroom at our friend's house and figuring out how to fly my ship through the gaps between the walls and the forest fields, etc. I asked to borrow the game and was surprisingly told that I could. For some reason, the kids didn't care about it much. It turned out to be, you know, a case of borrowing it indefinitely. I got the impression that their father used the 64 more than they did. Mainly, it appeared, to play Starcross by Infocom. I also played Parker Brothers' superb translation of Gyrus at their house a couple years later for the first time. Anyway, I played Zaxxon a lot at home and coveted the other Synapse games whose gameplay was shown for a few seconds apiece via the demo menu you could load instead of Zaxxon itself. I remember I mainly wanted Sentinel and Zeppelin. They looked like almost overwhelming fun. A classmate named Curtis in my middle school gave me my first floppy full of pirate <clears throat> archived games, still in 84, perhaps early 85. I was almost beside myself with excitement as I discovered that the directory had not been falsified as some kind of trick. The directory that, impossibly, told me that this single disk contained conversions of Defender, Robotron 2084, Battlezone, Centipede, Moon Patrol, Donkey Kong, and Pac-Man. 
as well as games I hadn't heard of, namely Minor 2049er and Pogo Joe. Let me tell you, my basic experiments took a back seat for at least a month as I played and played. I found all of Atari Soft's conversions excellent, apart from the still fun but pretty goofy Robotron 2084, which they pulled off, but in a weird, clunky manner. I immediately loved and tried to master Minor 2049er, and I was happy to discover that Pogo Joe is a very, very good Qbert clone. A ripoff in some ways, really, but it's got some distinctive elements, like the changing shape of the playfield. Thanks to an article in the only computer magazine I had found at the store and talked my dad into buying, an issue of Computes Gazette that had a cool looking game you could type in called 3D Labyrinth, I soon looked up, called and connected with a local BBS instead of CompuServe, which I'd used a few times but found kind of dull, and found actual games to download. I couldn't get the downloading process to start in Victorm itself, but there was another program on the disk called Xmodem, and I somehow got that to do the trick. I grabbed games that were obviously public domain and written in uncompiled basic, and weren't really worth the really long waits, you know, during the 120 baud <laughs> downloading process, um, such as the tedious Octopus's Lair and a weird puzzle game called Crypt, along with games that were presented as PD on the BBS, but which I discovered many years later were actually games sold on cassette by small firms in England. I guess they might have been PD and eventually picked up by those companies, but the superb game that I discovered much later, like in the 2000s, is actually called Paratrooper, was retitled Snipe Shooter. Richtofen's Revenge was renamed Baron's Revenge, and some game whose actual title I can't remember turned up as Omicron in a later issue of Computes Gazette. I also uh, incessantly played the extremely well done Monster Panic, the best version of Universal's arcade game Space Panic, and I'm including the original, and that later turned out to be sold by a British company under the same name. There was a rather generic slide and shoot 'em upward game called Space Shooter, and the programmer's name had been changed. I had seen the arcade game Kicks by Taito America and watched the demonstration mode while my folks were doing whatever they were doing at whichever place we were patronizing, but I didn't get to play. One of the games offered for downloading on one of the BBSs was titled Quicks, with the U added. I loved that game too, and I still think it's a great translation, but that was yet another game sold overseas. I can't remember its, its actual, or perhaps later, title. Then there were games that remain toss-ups to this day, in terms of their legitimacy as free downloads. The ones I can remember, and still play once in a while thanks to emulation, are Sub Shooter, a Pac-Man ripoff whose name I forget, and a basic Pac-Man half ripoff called WUG. <laughs> w -U -G. You can find these all in C64 Game Base. And that wasn't the only issue of Computes Gazette, I would, you know, go on to buy or have bought for me. Later I had a year's subscription to Run magazine. Learned a lot of basic tricks in that. Yes, I had returned to games, but I still used the computer for programming as well. In 1985, I bought the prime Activision title, Gary Kitchen's Game Maker, with my own saved up money. And although it didn't load the first time and my mom had to exchange it when I was at school the next day, and looking back, my disk drive was slightly out of alignment at that point. It eventually got fixed. I was smitten with the program. It's no drag-and-drop game construction set, that's for sure. There is indeed a sprite editor that allows for many frames of animation, if you want, a high-res background editor, a sound editor in which you really have to know your stuff to set all the values to render the sound you want in each case, and even a music maker but these are all brought together by commands in the programming segment of Game Maker, which, while containing joystick selectable commands from a menu, entails actual programming. Your hand is not held in any way, even within the simple looking commands, each of which is actually two or three machine language operations squashed into one. Well-planned, very structured programming is necessary, or it won't do anything for you. All of my basic experience up to that point came in very handy as the Game Maker programming module behaves very much like 
an advanced form of basic. You have to know what you're doing, and the manual is not a great deal of help. Also in the mid-80s, I remember um, experimenting with the basic keyword command, shortened to CMD. In order to get characters, I typed on my screen to be seen live by my friend Shane, who also had a Commodore 64, of course, um, while we were at our respective homes. So I accidentally invented chat, um, real-time chat. <laughs> you didn't have to press return for the other person to see what you were typing. But unlike AOL, or whichever company actually made chatting a commercial prospect, I had the sense to keep it to myself. Anyway, the fact is video games had caused me, and millions of other kids around the world, to be pre-comfortable with computers, so to speak. I wasn't intelligent or foresighted enough as a 12-year-old to conclude that the future would inevitably be digital. But those of us who played Atari, or, you know, in television or Odyssey 2, or ColecoVision, TI, whatever, would not go on to view computers as intimidating in any sense. We weren't scared of using them on, on any level, as many in the generations before us were. So those are my uh, early experiences with my first computer, and I could go on, clearly, but I hope you found this film fun to watch and listen to. Thanks, and so long for now.